Welcome to a video instructional tape on the subject of coupler curves. I'm Professor Robert Norton from Worcester Polytech, and we're going to tell you a little bit about uh, the very ubiquitous coupler curve of four bar and five bar linkages. Coupler curves are generated by what I think is the most interesting link in a four bar linkage, not surprisingly called the coupler. It's interesting because it has complex motion. So every, every, every point on that link is, um, or any line on the link is going through a combination of translation and rotation as the linkage moves. Whereas the uh, other two links that move in a four bar, for example, being the crank and the rocker, have pure rotation. And we can have an infinite number of points on this coupler, or on any link for that matter. And any one of those points will generate a curve that, in general, is a tricircular sextic. That's just a fancy uh, terminology indicating that it is of sixth degree. And it can uh, have three loops. That's the tricircular designation. A fellow named Knoll, back in 1975, made this comment, which I thought was interesting. He says the coupler curve equation is very complex, and no other mathematical result has characteristics matching those of a coupler curve. So it's a fairly unique mathematical entity, at least in his opinion. As I said, you can have an infinity of coupler curves with any one four-bar linkage, and since you can change the link lengths, that means you have multiple infinities of possibilities. This diagram shows a four bar linkage, crank, let's assume it's a crank rocker, so I can call this a crank, pivoted at O2. So that would be link two. The uh, link three is this entire mess of holes. Link four is the rocker over here, pivoting it to ground at this point on link three. Now we typically draw these links in the textbooks as lines connecting the points, and that may leave the student unaware of the fact that the link can extend in all directions to any degree and doesn't change the kinematics. The kinematic motion is defined just by the point-to-point -point lengths of the links that comprise the linkage. But we can extend those rigid body links in all directions as much as we like, which I've done here. And I've peppered it full of holes such that I could conceivably put a pencil through that hole, move the linkage through its motions, and it will trace the curve that we're talking about. These curves uh, come in a variety of shapes, and I've uh, taken uh, to giving them names here. Uh, highly technical names, as you can see, such as kidney bean, banana, uh, crescent, teardrop, and so on. Uh, these are just representative of the kinds of shapes you can get from these coupler curves. Some of the more interesting features that uh, are useful from an engineering standpoint are the fact that many of these curves have a, a, an approximate straight line segment. It, you cannot get an exact straight line with four bars. You have to go up to six bars or a geared five bar to get an exact straight line. But for engineering purposes, these four bar linkages can give you a sufficiently accurate straight line in many cases. So uh, I can get a pair of those on a given coupler curve are a single one. Another useful feature is the cusp and also its cousin the crew node. These are sometimes termed double points. It's pretty obvious in the case of the crew node why that name is applied. It has two slopes, two velocities. Depending upon which direction you approach that point on the plane as you come through it on the coupler, you will have a different velocity obviously whether you're on this path or that path. That's where the term double point comes from. The cusp is a, uh, a point which has zero velocity instantaneously. So as I traverse this curve, I accelerate smoothly to zero velocity, and then I accelerate away in a, slight, a different direction. Um, this is potentially useful for stamping operations or pick and place where I want to pick a part off of a feed chute or something like that. <clears throat> I can have as many as three cusps or three crew nodes or any combination of three for example, this shows two crew nodes and a cusp, and this shows two cusps and three cusps, respectively. Now, I'm going to demonstrate these with a few models to you so you can get a little sense of how these curves are generated. So what I've done is I've made up some simple 
cardboard models. And just as in my sketch, I've punched the uh, coupler full of holes so I can trace with a pen. So this is my link two here. That's instance center two, three right there. That, of course, is a coupler point. But that's going to trace a circle. This is a Grashoff linkage, by the way. So if I take that particular coupler point, why is it a coupler point? Because it belongs to link three. It's also instant center two, three, so it also belongs to link two. So it's sort of schizophrenic. As part of link two, it's being forced to rotate in a uh, circular arc about instant center one, two down here. And thus, this is a degenerate coupler curve in, a, in our sense of sixth order curves. It's degenerated to second order, or second degree, I should say. However, if I take a point, say, here, and I trace its curve, you can see it has somewhat more interesting shape, sort of a flattened ellipse. It's partly hidden by my cardboard, but if I move the cardboard around, you can get a sense of it. In general, points close to instant center 2, 3 are going to be relatively uniform in shape, being somewhat elliptical. This guy over here is going to have a bit of a flat on it. It's, again, being hidden a bit by itself, but there's the flat side. So that's a bit of a single straight. And if I go perhaps out to the end here, I can get something looking sort of like a flattened kidney bean kind of shape, also having something approaching a straight line segment here. So that gives you a little sense of the kinds of shapes you can get. Now that happens to be a Grashoff. I have another example here of a Grashoff linkage in cardboard. Uh, I don't have quite as large a coupler on this, so it makes it a little bit easier to see. I don't hide so much of the curve, but just to, again to prove to you that this is in fact Grashoff, I'll make that go around in a complete circle. If you've uh, seen the Grashoff tape, then you know all about that. And by that same token, this point over here, which is instant center 3, 4, if I back drive the linkage from the rocker, that's in fact a couple of curve because it belongs to link 3, but it's another one of those degenerate versions because it's gone down to second degree by reason of the fact that it's also constrained to pivot about instant center 1, 4 down here in pure rotation. But now, I've extended the coupler up here with a piece of cardboard and punched some holes in it. So if I drive it from there, I get something of a kidney bean shape there. These are going to be fairly similar to one another because they're so close together on the coupler. But I made the small coupler, as I said, so you could see the curves without too much interference. So there it gives you some sense of um, some variety of shapes that you can get. And you should not be surprised by the fact that given a Grashoff linkage w in which one link can make a full circle, these are closed curves. The couple of curves all close. Now let's take a non-Grashoff linkage as an example, also made in cardboard, <coughs> and see what we can do with it. Well, just let's determine to your satisfaction that it is, in fact, non-Grashoff. There, my hand's in your way, but if, if I do this with my non-dominant hand here, if I can get that through the hole, my pen isn't going through for some reason. But you can see that I'm going at a toggle. So that cannot go any further that way. And if I go this way, it's going to toggle over here again. So I definitely have a non-Grashoff linkage. I can't make a full revolution with any link. But if I now go up on the coupler and I grab one of these points, let's say I take the fur one furthest out here as a starting point, and I try to drive it up here. I'm going to help the links through the toggle positions with my other hand here. Okay, let's look at that one for a minute. My hand wiggled a bit at the top there. There shouldn't be double lines. It should trace exactly the same curve on each traverse. Now here we have a more interesting looking curve. 
this is a non grashoff linkage, no link to make a full revolution, but note number one, we have a closed curve nevertheless. So the coupler curves will be closed irrespective of the Grashoff condition of the linkage. Number two, we seem to have two cusps, one here, one there, and some interesting shape curve in between. Let's try this point here and see what happens. Again, I'm helping it through the toggle points with my other hand. And there's a little bit of give in the cardboard accounting for the fact that I don't have exactly the same traverse when I come back over it the second time. And again, since these, these points are all fairly close to one another on the coupler, I'm seeing what uh, definite family resemblance from one to the other. I'm still getting some cusps down here. And finally, down there. Okay, here I got a crew note. I, I was looking for the crew note. I knew there was one in here someplace. So this one gave me a crew node, and some of the others gave me a cusp. So that gives you some sense of what we can do in terms of shapes for these curves. But how do we find a linkage that gives us a curve of the shape that we like? Typically in a design situation, we're coming at this from the other direction. We're not just arbitrarily picking a link and saying, oh, aren't those couple of curves pretty? We typically have some idea as to what we would like for a shape of a curve, perhaps, and we'd like to find the linkage. This is the inverse problem. And it turns out it's a relatively difficult problem to solve. And what makes it easier to find such a linkage is to have a collection of uh, curves drawn uh, by linkages of various dimensions, and that exists in several forms, one of which is this so-called Hrones and Nelson atlas. And uh, I have that atlas here, and in a moment I'm going to go into it and show you how to extract the information, but before I do that, I want to give you a little preview of, of the way it's arranged. This is a figure out of your book, Design of Machinery, and it shows one page out of that atlas, and you can see that it shows a linkage the, it's a little hard to see at this scale, but there are two circles in that place, and uh, that indicates a fixed pivot. Single circle indicates a moving pivot. So this would be link two right here. That's instant center two one. This is coupler, line to line, line from pin to pin. This is the rocker. This is the ground link, and these points right here are just like my holes in my cardboard, they're points on link three. The surround is not drawn on the picture, but they're physically part of link three. And you see a, quite a collection of different curves. Here's a cusp, there's a crew node, there's another crew node, there's a crew node, there's a cusp, etc., etc. How do I extract the linkage information from this book? Well, I'm going to show you that in detail in a second, but in general, this is the approach. Here I've superposed the linkage on the atlas page for this particular curve that looks like a bit of a figure eight. That's the point generating the figure eight, so I have to encapsulate that in my coupler. So I show the coupler here with a triangular shape. I've heavied in the links. There's link two, link one I show dotted, link four, and the actual pin-to-pin -pin dimension of link three. Now, up here in the corner, not visible at this scale, but you'll see it clearly in a minute, is a little chart on each page that tells you what the link ratios are. In this book, there, uh, every um, crank is considered to be one unit long, and the, he gives you the ratios of the other link lengths with respect to that. So let me go now to the book itself. This Rones and Nelson Atlas is long out of print. It was done in 1951. Uh, but I've obtained the publisher's permission to reproduce it as uh, PDF files. Um, and they've been scanned, and they're on your DVD in your book. So you actually have access to it and can use it for your assignments if your instructor uh, so wishes. So now let's go look at the book. And also the four-bar linkage, very old book. It's by... 
Professor Holmes and Mr. Nelson, uh, Professor Nelson, I, I guess, also, of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it's done in 1951. And this actually was uh, Nelson's thesis. Back in 51, of course, there were no computers, and the only way you could generate these curves was to mechanically create them. So they actually made the links. I want to show you this figure down here in detail, right here on the corner. This is the way they've arranged the atlas. So here you see link 2, link 4, and an expanded coupler, much like my cardboard model, which is peppered full of holes. And they typically have five rows of ten holes each on each linkage. And they're going to iterate the link dimensions, i.e. the link ratios, as you go through the book. So on any one page of the atlas, you will find a linkage of a particular set of ratios, that is the ratio of the crank to the couplet to the rocker to the ground will be certain numbers. And on that page, you will see one of these rows of dots um, generating their coupler curves. And then as you turn to the next page, you will see the next row. And they typically start at the top row and work down. And then the third row and the fourth row and the fifth row. So for every particular linkage geometry, there will be five pages in succession that show you the curves of all 50, 5 by 10 typically, coupler curves. The total is something of the order of 7,000 coupler curves represented in this book. I don't have an exact count, but it's in that ballpark. So let's move to a page that has uh, the information on it. I'll just go to page one, I guess, and uh, start at the beginning. A very good place to start. OK, so here's the whole page. We can just focus in on this bottom piece here, I think would be fine. Um, give an overview first. So this looks much like the. Um, figure in the book that you've just seen a moment ago. And up here in the right-hand corner, let's, let's zoom in on that so we can see that a little more clearly. Thank you. That's better. So here we have a little diagram. He doesn't bother to draw the surround of that link. It's not necessary, but that's like the diagram I showed you a moment ago. That's the extended coupler. And it has the five rows of dots representing holes, if you, if you will. Um, the ratios here, A, B, and C, here all being 1.5, represent the lengths of the coupler divided by the crank. That's A. B is the rocker divided by the crank. And C is the ground link divided by the crank. So that's pretty easy. And recognize that these things are scalable, so that if you were to double the size of all the links, you will get exactly the same curve shapes. Of course, your velocities and accelerations will change drastically if you drive that larger linkage at the same speed. But in terms of the physical shapes of the coupler curves and the positions of the links, the angular positions of the links, those are all scalable. So you can just take these ratios and apply them to any size crank that you desire to get the size of curve that you are interested in. All right, so let me flip through fairly quickly here, the first five pages to give you a reinforce this idea of how they've arranged it. So here we see the curves associated with the top row of the matrix. For some reason, in this particular one, there are two, four, six, eight. I don't know what happened to the other two, but many of the pages will have 10. So there's going to be 40 curves in this particular set. So there is page one. Now we go to page two. I'll pull that down, get onto the camera. And this is the same link ratios. You can't see them at this scale, but it's still one and a half, one and a half, one and a half. And we've moved down to the second row. The previous page was up here. And we have another set of, in this case, eight curves. By the way, all the uh, links, linkages in this book are Grashoff. And if we go to the next page, which is page three, we now have eight more curves, and so forth and so on. So this is page, I don't know, up to page four. And they actually show you up in this matrix, you see a solid line drawn on the dots to indicate where you are in the matrix of the coupler. So now I'm below the line of the coupler by one row. 
Notice that one row of dots is on the line of centers of the coupler, and there are two above and two below. So right now we're one below. And finally, at page 5, we are at the bottom row of the coupler. And our curves are now down here with respect to the linkage geometry. I'll go one more page to, sh to show you that. And perhaps now we can zoom in on this little corner again and show that now on this sixth page, we're back up to the top row of the matrix starting over again. But now the link lengths are, the link ratios have changed to one and a half, two, two. They were one and a half, one and a half, one and a half before. So a new set of new family of links. What I'd like to do now is try by example to show you how I would extract the information from this atlas for a sort of a practical problem. I'll admit I made the problem up, but it's not an unrealistic problem. Let's assume that I have a machine that is making some kind of a product, and it's making it uh, at some reasonable speed, and it's automated, and I want to be able to feed parts down some kind of a feed chute here, perhaps blow them with the air or just let gravity bring them down. It depends on the circumstances. And I want to pick those parts off one at a time, slice them off the bottom of the stack perhaps, and I want to deliver them to a moving conveyor. And I want to transfer them from my gripper, which is not shown here, that's going to pick them off the bottom of the stack. I want to transfer them by some means at the right time in the cycle to a nest of some sort that's on this conveyor, and, and thus I can do some further uh, operations on that, quite likely add some other parts. I'm making an assembly of something or other here. So my concept that I start with is uh, to say, well, gee, this is a nice application for a cusp because, look, this, this parts feeder is stationary. It's on the ground plane. So if I'm going to pick something off the bottom of that stack, I've got to be stopped, at least for an instant. And a cusp is exactly that. It stops for an instant. So if I stop just long enough for a vacuum or some other means to suck that part away, I then want to accelerate the part down some path. I don't really care too much about the shape of that path, but at some point I'd like it to become fairly straight. I'm going to darken that in. It didn't show up too well from my previous sketch. So here's my cusp. I'm going to pick it up at the bottom of the parts feeder. And I want to, let's say I want to make it come down, and I don't care too much about the shape of this here. But at some point, I want to get more or less parallel to the conveyor so I can track it. And I also have to arrange things so that I match velocities at least to a reasonable tolerance. I don't have to be exactly the same velocity. I can be for an instant, certainly, but I don't have to be over the entire track. And once I've made the transfer, then I just want to go back home and do it over again. So I get out of here, turn, turn the corner, come back up some other path like so, and back to my cusp to repeat the cycle. So this, my linkage, which is not yet shown here, that's what I'm trying to find, is going to be uh, driven by the same motor that drives this conveyor, such that everything's in synchrony, so that as a part appears in the location, proper location here, um, as the nest appears, my part will also appear and be transferred. Okay, That's the idea. So. I'm now looking for, in my mind, I'm looking for a curve that sort of looks like Willie the Whale here. Okay. I want to now go into my Hrones and Nelson Atlas and see what I can find. So we'll put that aside. And I happen to be sitting at page 7. I'm just going to keep going and see what I can find. So I'll turn it over. I'm not even going to look at the, the top pages. It's too much trouble to move the book around. Uh, I'll just look at the bottom here. So here I see some curves that have not quite a cusp. I don't see a cusp. There's a crew node. No real cusps on that page, and I'm looking for a cusp. Here on this next page, well, there's a cusp. There's a cusp right there. And lo and behold, there's a sort of a flat spot on that, and then it returns back to here. That looks like it might work. So let's try that one. So let's suppose that I'm attracted to that particular coupler curve, and I decide I want to make that linkage. How do I determine what the links should be? That's the next step. So I'm going to use a piece of tracing paper so I don't mark up this rare old book. <coughs> and I'm going to need some drawing instruments for this, too. That paper doesn't quite go as high as I would like, but I think I can get away with it. 
Let's, okay, that's going to do. That's perfectly fine. Now, I look up on the upper corner here. You can't see it. We won't bother to zoom in, but I'll tell you, this is 1.5 is A, and uh, B is 2.5, and C is 2.5. So I know already the dimensions of my links, and I can let my crank be any value I want. It can be 10 inches, it can be 2 inches, it can be uh, 75 millimeters, whatever I feel like. In fact, if I put my scale on this drawing in the book, I find that it's pretty close to two and a half inches. So my crank at the scale this book is drawn is 2.5 inches. I'm going to stick with that for the moment just to not complicate things further. So that means that my uh, coupler, A would be the coupler, would be one and a half times that. So that would be two and a half plus one and a quarter. So that would be what? 3.75 inches then. And um, my crank is going to be the same dimension. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm misreading it. My, my, um, I meant to say my rocker. That should be rocker. I've already got the crank, the crank I measured. So the rocker here is, this is the coupler, this is the rocker, and this is the ground, so we don't get those confused. So my crank is two and a half, my coupler is one and a half times that, which is the three and three quarters. My rocker is two and a half times this. Well, twice that would be five, and another half would be one and a quarter. So that like, sounds like six and a quarter. And the ground is the same as the rocker, 6.25. So now I have my physical link lengths for an arbitrarily chosen length of crank, okay? That's easy. That's the easy part. But now I've got to find out where this couple point is. First of all, I've got to detect what point is generating this Willy the Whale curve that I'm interested in, and you look and see what circle is sitting on that curve, and there it is. I want to locate that with respect to the links. So let me start drawing some things on here. There's my link 2. I'm going to put a little round pivot thing here to emphasize the fact that that's a fixed pivot. So that in your book would be labeled O2 most likely. And we'll put a pivot over here and we'll call this O4 down here. And here is my link 4. Let's label that as 4. And label it as 2. 2 is going to be the crank, 4 is the rocker. That's the conventional notation that I use in your textbook. And here is link three. Now this is the line of centers of the coupler. So that's the kinematic coupler, I'll call it. But I want to extend that coupler. I'm going to have to make that coupler include this point out here that generates the curve of interest. And the shape of that can be whatever I feel like. But that's the point of interest. Now, in order to determine where that is, I've got two options. I need two coordinates, obviously, to locate a point with respect to another, or with respect to an axis system, right? I need either an X and a Y or an R and a theta. I think I'm going to call it delta, because I call it that in the book. So we'll call this delta 3. Okay? That's my angle reference to a local coordinate system, which I would call X prime, Y prime. That's a local rotating coordinate system in my terminology in your design of machinery book. And this distance, I would, let's give this a name. Let's call this point P. So this would be R of P, position vector P, going up to there. Now, if I had a protractor, which I didn't bring with me today, I could measure this angle delta 3 on here, and I could take my ruler, which I did bring, and I could measure that length. I can find out that RP at this scale should be 6 and 5 eighths inches or thereabouts. Okay, so I already know that this is 6.25 inches, uh, 6 to 5 inches, I said 6 and 5 eighths, yeah, 6 and 5 eighths. 
6.625 inches, let's say. But I forgot my protractor, so what am I going to do? Well, it's actually, I, I didn't really forget my protractor. I deliberately left it home because I knew it wouldn't give me as good a result as if I measured the Cartesian coordinates. It's much more accurate in general to measure lengths than to measure angles. Protractors are not a very accurate device. So I'm going to create a little axis system here more accurately than I did before freehand with my triangles, which I did bring. So there is my, I'll relabel that Y prime and move my label up out of here. So I now have a proper axis system there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure with my rule the XY coordinates of that guy. And that to reasonable accuracy is 6.2. So the X is equal to 6.2. And the Y is equal to this dimension right here which, uh, if I get my head out of the way, you can see what I'm doing. Um, looks like it might be 2 and three, 7 sixteenths. Pretty close. Let's, let's call it 2.42. 2.42 inches. Okay. So all I've done, then, is I've measured this dimension right here as 2.42 inches, and I've measured this dimension here. as, what was it, 6.2 inches. And I've now located that in my local coordinate system within the coupler, because it's part of the coupler. Now, when I go to program 4 bar, which I'm going to do in a minute, because I want to put this linkage in there and generate that curve, I'm going to need the polar coordinates. But I did bring my calculator along. So I can take those dimensions, and I can find that angle, can I not? So if I take 2.42, and I divide that, that's the y, if I divide that by x, 6.2, and if I take the angle whose tangent is that number, I find that my angle here is 21.322 degrees, and I could not have read it that accurately with a protractor. Okay, so I now have the data. I know that my link lengths are what I wrote over here, 2 and a half, 3, 7, 5, 6, 2, 5, et cetera. And I know that my coupler point is at r is equal to 6.2 at an angle of, what do we say, 21 point, I'm going to call it 3, 2, that's close enough, degrees. Okay? So now I'm ready to go to, out of, leave this atlas and go to my um, program. But before I do, if we could come back to the atlas page for just a second, I want to point something else out that I haven't mentioned yet, which is very important. This atlas has a lot of information in it, much more so than first meets the eye. I've already described to you how they're plotting these paths of the various points on the coupler of the linkage, and they're changing the linkage dimensions, etc. But they very cleverly did something more than that. You'll notice that these curves are all done with dashed lines, not with solid lines. And the dashes have meaning. They, each of the dashes that you see on any one of these coupler curves represents exactly five degrees of crank rotation. Actually, to say that more correctly, the distance from the beginning of one dash to the beginning of the next is five degrees of crank rotation. So think about that. If I'm, if I'm turning the crank at a constant speed, then equal angles are equal time. So if you look at the curve that I just chose, and you look at the relative lengths of the dashes on the back side here versus down here, I can impute a lot about the velocity of that point. For one thing, it's going faster on the back side than it is here, because for the same delta time, which is to say delta angle of the crank at constant speed, I'm moving about three times as far as I am down here. That's the first thing that I notice. The second thing I notice is that during this portion of the curve down here, there's relatively little change in the lengths of those dashes. That indicates that I'm very nearly constant speed there. That's desirable. Remember I said at the outset that I wanted something approximating constant velocity to track my conveyor. Well, I didn't make that point when I first chose this curve. Coming 
down here, I'm moving at relatively constant velocity. It's speeding up a little bit there, and then it slows down again as it comes around the corner, and then it goes like the dickens back to my cusp. This would be called a quick return mechanism if I consider this to be the forward motion and this to be the return. So by just looking at these curves, I can see the relative quick return nature of them. I can see the actually impute some crude acceleration information because as the velocities, um, as, as indicated by the lengths of these dashes, is changing rapidly, that indicates I have high accelerations. I can't get any real acceleration numbers out of that that are worth anything. But I get a very good holistic, intuitive feel for the way that curve is going to behave when I drive it with a constant speed crank. Okay, enough of that. Let's move now to the um, program. I'll close that for the moment and go back to the computer over here. And um, we'll bring the data into program 4-bar, for which purpose I have to uh, interrupt my um, PowerPoint presentation here and bring back the four bar. There we go. So if you've had any chance to use this program four bar, then you know what you're looking at. If not, then perhaps you're seeing this for the first time. Uh, there is also a videotape on how to use this program. If you haven't learned how to use it yet, you can avail yourself of that. I'm going to go to the input screen here and this provides me with these boxes in which I can type the dimensions of the links, and I'm going to go back to my, I don't have to look at this with me, but I can read the numbers off of my previous um, paper here. We decided that the crank wanted to be 2.5, which just by happenstance that it already is, that wasn't planned. The coupler we decided wanted to be 3.75. I'm tabbing between these boxes. Uh, the rocker wanted to be 6.25, I think we said. The distance to the coupler point, we said, was 6.2. And the angle to the coupler point was 21.32 degrees. And I also have to deal with the ground link. I'm going to do that down here. Now, um, the program lets me put the ground link at an angle other than zero. And it may not have been obvious to you, I didn't point it out, but the way the Crohn's and Nelson is arranged, that ground link was not at zero, it was at some other angle. I don't even know what that angle is at the moment. So I'm going to go to polar coordinates here and just tell it the length of that link. And I'm going to draw it in four bar as if it were horizontal. And we can change that later. But that ground link was also 6.25. And that should be enough information to calculate it. Now, over here, I, I should tell it where to start and where to end. We want to see the whole curve. So I'm going to start it at 0 and go to 360. And I don't think we need 1 degree increments. I'll go in 5 degree increments. And omega can be whatever we like. I'll leave it at 1 rating per second. It's not critical to this discussion. And I hit the calculate. And that doesn't look an awful lot like the curve that I saw in Hrones and Nelson. But you'll notice that this is in the crossed mode up here in the upper left-hand corner. And if you've read Chapter 4 yet, which you may not have at this stage of the course, I, I take a couple of curves up before we get to that business. But let me just tell you that um, a four-bar linkage can be assembled in one of two modes. I call them open and crossed. And it's not possible to predict which you have at the outset. And it happened that I had this in crossed mode, and it happens that that one out of the atlas is open mode. Notice when I switch it from one to the other, we get a curve that looks a little bit more like Willie the Whale. That looks like what I want. Now, you recall that in the book, the uh, whale was laying over more on its side here. And uh, maybe I want to make it look like that. To do so, I simply have to tell it what angle the ground link is at. And I measured this earlier, and I think it's of the order of minus 40 degrees or thereabouts. That's in the ballpark, at least. So I'm going to tell it to go there and recalculate. And that looks a little bit more like uh, what we saw in the book. So it's laying down in that mode. My pivot has gone off screen down here now. I could correct that by bringing this back up to zero. 
I just wanted you to see that this looked more or less like that picture in the book. But let's put that back at zero and get it back on the screen. So I can run this now through its motion with the run command. Let me turn off the centros. I don't need those. And let me also try to slow that down a little bit. That's a little bit better. And you get a little sense of the uh, quick return aspect of this. If I go in smaller increments, that'll be even more obvious. Let me cut that down to one degree over here and recalc and then run it. Uh, my screen update rate can of keep up with that now. So we're having a little bit of problem with the computer being able to show all of those. Let's go to, that's a little bit better, at two degree increments. So now I have a linkage that will give me the kind of motion that I thought I wanted, and the process that I went through was to sketch out what I thought I needed, go into Holmes and Nelson, find something reasonably close to that, extract the information from that atlas that allowed me to come into this program or in some other means, and put in the dimensions of the linkage, essentially, is all it amounts to, and calculate and run it. And now I can analyze this to my heart's content and determine whether or not it will do the job. And if it doesn't, I go back to the atlas and pick something else. There's 7,000 of them there, after all, for you to pick from. Okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint and see where we are here. So we just did that. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about applications. What do we do with these coupler curves? Well, it turns out there's a lot we can do with them, not just that part feeder thingy that I invented for the example before. Here's a real problem that's been solved for a long, long time with a coupler curve. The film advance mechanism in the movie projector at the theater where you go to see the latest flick may in fact have a mechanism such as this. It's a Grashoff four-bar linkage and it has a couple of point that has a curve of this shape with a cusp. And the idea here, very briefly, is um, you may or may not be aware of the fact that move, what we call movies are really not moving. It's a series of still pictures. It's essentially a very fast slideshow. But the slides get put on the screen so rapidly that our eyes consider them to be a continuum. Because our eyes, the reaction time of our eyes, our eye-brain combo, is not fast enough to see the individual pictures. Uh, I think the rate is about uh, 24 frames per second, and we can't really see things happening that fast. So it appears to us as if it's a continuously changing series of images, but it in fact is not. So to accomplish that illusion, um, the film projector, and for that matter the camera, must expose the film, in the case of the projector, to the, tr the light that's going to put it on the screen for a brief moment, I think a sixtieth of a second is typical, and then close the shutter so the screen goes black, move the film to the next picture, and then open up the shutter and let it go light again so you see the new picture. This mechanism is what moves the film from one position to the other. So the film is moving, stopping, moving, stopping, moving, stopping 24 times a second. And while it's stopped, the shutter opens up to let the light through for about a 60th of a second, and you see the image. And it remains in your brain long enough uh, that you think it's still there when the next image appears. So this mechanism has a little hook on it. And as, if you've ever seen film, you know there are, there are holes down the side of the film. So this sticks its nose into a hole and grabs the film and pulls it down in the direction of the red arrow. The film itself is guided in what's called a gate. It's simply a, a, a track, so the film has to go straight. So it isn't necessary for this hook to go in a perfect straight line, and it does not. As I mentioned before, a four-bar linkage cannot give you a perfect straight line, just an approximate one but it is close enough for this purpose. But at the bottom, you want to back this hook out of the film without j jarring the film, because if you give the film a little bit of a tweak on the way out, just as the shutter opens, you're going to see a, a, your image on the screen jitter. So the cusp is used to back that hook, which actually has engagement with the film hole, back up out of engagement without jarring the film. So the motion then is pull the film down, get out of it, the film is now uh, visible on the screen, during the backstroke, it's wasting time while you're looking at the picture. 
Now the shutter is closed, the screen has gone black, it grabs the film, yanks it down very quickly to the next position, backs out, the shutter opens, you see the new image. I'll show you a model of that in just a moment. Another very common application of coupler curves is automotive suspension. Here in a figure that's from your book, uh, schematically depicts a, an automotive suspension system, could be front or rear. Um, four bar linkage, link two connects the wheel assembly which is on link three, the coupler, back to the chassis as does link four. These are typically non grash off. I don't think you want your wheels going around in circles in this plane at least. Uh, so there's no need to have a grash off linkage here. The spring and shock absorber not shown are what control its motion and keep it from going all the way up. But in fact, the path of motion of the tire as it traverses bumps is along a coupler curve, actually a whole family of coupler curves because each point on this coupler, as you now should understand, has a different coupler curve. This is a, a, a schematic, actually a drawing of a Chrysler Viper, I guess it's a Dodge Viper, um, suspension system. Uh, this is courtesy of Chrysler. They gave me the drawing. Uh, and these are referred to as wishbones. You may be familiar with that term if you've fiddled with automobiles at all. But this is in the upper diagram. This would be my link two. This is the link three assembly. That's the wheel spindle right there, the wheel bearing. There's the tire. And here's what I call link four in the picture up above. And the spring and the shock is a little bit differently arranged than I show up above. So there are a couple of applications. Now let me show you a model of this film projector mechanism, which is quite clever. This has been around for, I think, close to a century, as long as movies have been around, which is quite a long time now. So here we have um, that same linkage or something very close to it. And I'll prove to you, first of all, I hope, if I can get my pen through there, that this, my pen doesn't want to go through that hole. So maybe I won't prove to you that this is a grass shaft. Well, you can see it goes around in circles. Now, there's an example of a cross and open. I just flipped it from one to the other. So the cardboard's a little bit uh, flexible. So let me not be so aggressive with it. I'll be more gentle this time. And I'll move it through. And you can see that my left hand here is driving the crank in a full circle. And the couple is doing something or other. Let's investigate what the couple is doing by putting my pin in here. At least that will go through the hole. Let's go the other way, because this is the way it's actually going to go. I'm pulling the film down. I'm at the cusp. I back out of the hole in the film. I come up around the top. I'm on the back. And my hand's in the way, too. Let's use my other hand. I'm on the back stroke. And now I'm coming around again. I'm going to pick up an, the film again and pull it down. The shutter's closed. The screen is black. You can't see what's going on if you're in the theater. Now I'm down at the bottom here, and it's, the shutter's now opening, so you can see the next image on the screen. I'm coming around the backstroke, wasting time. Shutter's closing. Screen's gone black. I pulled the film down again, and that should give you some idea of how this works. Very simple mechanism, and it's driven directly off the same shaft that's causing the film reels to turn, the, uh, feeding the film into the gate and picking it back up, wrapping it up on the reel down below. So that should give you a little idea of a practical use of a coupler curve. Let's go back to our slideshow here. I'm going to change the picture a little bit, um, I'll change the focus, I guess, to uh, geared five bars. Any linkage of any number of links generates couple curves, assuming it has a couple link, and most of them do. So now we're going to up the ante and go to a five bar linkage. And if you have read your chapter two information on degrees of freedom, you should know that if you had five bars and five pins, you will have two degrees of freedom requiring two inputs. And that's not usually what we want. Motors are kind of expensive. I don't want to put two motors on and have to have them synchronized to one another and such. So a simple solution to that problem is to connect links two and five, as shown here, with a pair of gears. I can put the motor now either on five or two, and when I turn that shaft, this guy falls along dutifully at whatever gear ratio I provide, and my link three and link four are both couplers, and I can get an infinity couple of curves off of each, and the point three, four 
which is the join between the two links, will also generate a couple of curves. And that's what I'm going to show you here. There is a, an atlas similar to the Hermes and Nelson called the Zhang Norton Hammond Atlas of geared five bar couple of linkages. I have that with me and I'll show you it in a moment. Uh, this is one page from it, which is in your book. And because we have um, more parameters, which I can show you here, these couple of curves for five bars have much more complex shapes than a four bar. And the main reason is because we have three more design parameters than we have in the four bar. We have the additional link ratio because there is a fifth link. We have the gear ratio as a parameter that can be varied. We have the phase angle between the gears. In other words, I can pick the two gears out of engagement, rotate one of them, and drop them back into engagement, and I will get new couple of curves because I've changed the initial conditions, the initial position of one gear with respect to the other. If I provide it with an integer gear ratio, I will get a repeating curve. If it's one to one, it's, it's rather uninteresting. If it's two to one, it'll repeat after two revolutions, three to one after three revolutions, etc. If I have a non-repeating decimal ratio for a gear ratio, such as pi, for example, uh, a number that never really settles down, uh, then I will get a coupler curve that continues to change shape in a precessing fashion. Not necessarily practical, but kind of interesting. Let's look at the atlas now and see what uh, it can tell us about these curves. It's arranged in a similar fashion to that of the uh, Crohn's and Nelson, but it's much smaller. It also was done much more recently, and so was generated with computer resources, making it a lot easier to do than Mr. Holmes and Mr. Nelson actually built metal linkage models and drew those curves manually, would you believe, all 7,000 of them. So if we can focus in on this upper corner here, much like the Holmes and Nelson Atlas, there's a, a little bit of information here to tell you what uh, parameters are, what the parameters for this linkage are. Alpha, beta, and lambda are the three ratios. Again, the crank is considered to be one unit in length. And also, I should mention that this atlas deals only with what are termed symmetrical five-bar linkages, which is to say that link one and link five are the same length, and link three and link four are the same length. So alpha, then, is the ratio of link four or three to one. Beta is the ratio of the ground link link one to one to, to, the, to the crank, and lambda is the gear ratio. And a negative gear ratio indicates that you have um, a pair of gears, typically, one of which turns the other in the opposite direction. If this were positive one, it would imply that you had a, uh, an idler gear present to reverse the rotation so that crank 5 would turn in the same direction as crank 1. So this ratio can be either plus or minus, and it can be either um, uh, an integer or not, though I think integer is a more practical solution. So a negative 1 ratio, gear ratio, doesn't give curves, if we come back, if we can zoom back out to the page um, to give you some sense of what the curves look like with, with that ratio. Um, these are rather mundane. I mean, they look for all the world like they were generated with a four-bar linkage. Here I have some crew nodes. I have a cusp. I got some, I don't see really a lot of flat stuff, but there's a figure eight up there. Rather mundane, not too interesting. This shows you the linkage down here in one particular position. That would be link two, the crank. This would be link three, one of the couplers. Link four, one of the couplers. This atlas also only shows you curves at this join between the two couplers and recognize the fact that I could put, let me get a piece of tracing paper. I can expand the, uh, either of those links to include a whole bunch of other points. So I can get a lot of variety. And I'm not going to show it to you today since this tape is running too long already. But uh, program 5-bar will let you bring the information from this atlas into it, just as I did from the Hrones into the 4-bar. And you can then create some couple of point over here and generate whatever curve it might make. So again, this is a starting point for determining a linkage that may have suitable properties. 
before I leave this page, let me point out that at a certain uh, phase angle, these numbers down here represent the phase angles between the input and output gears, the gear on link 2 versus the gear on link 5. The numbers are not too readable at this scale. It's 0, 15 degrees, 30, 45, etc., through 180. So the only difference, the, the, on, the, the only thing I have to change to go from this curve to this curve to this curve is to pull the gears apart, rotate one, and put them back together again, changing their phase angle. They're all negative one gear ratio. With a 180 degree phase angle, I get a perfect straight line, and this is not approximate. This is on the money. So this will generate an exact straight line. Kind of an expensive way to get the straight line because of the gears, but nevertheless. Okay, I'm going to flip through this to get to some more interesting looking curves. I'm still in the minus one gear ratio department here, and that doesn't have very interesting stuff. It looks too much like a four bar linkage. Uh, now I'm in positive one. And as I show you in design of machinery, um, at some point, you can actually generate a, the same couple of curve that a four bar linkage generates with a geared five bar linkage that has a positive one gear ratio. This is in chapter six under the topic of cognates. So let's keep going. I want to get to some more interesting gear ratios. We're still in the ones. Here we come to a minus two. Now this is starting to look a little more interesting. So. This, I won't bother to zoom in on it, but this says I have an alpha 3.2, a beta 3.2, and a lambda of minus 2. So the gear ratio here is negative 2, which means one gear is twice as large as the other. And there are only two of them, so they turn in opposite directions, and thus the negative sign. And now, because of the, the uh, gear ratio of 2, I have at least two loops, it seems, in all of these. And in some cases, I have three loops. This is bordering on four down here. Again, the difference here is phase angle only. So everything on this page has these ratios, but the family shown differs only in the phase angle. And all of them, unlike the Holmes and Nelson, I don't give you a map of these across the real estate of the coupler, but rather just show you that one point. Program five bar will give you additional information. So you would take the data out of here in the same fashion. Here is still minus 2, very similar looking. And if you start using other gear ratios, you're going to get very much more interesting looking curves. Another minus 2. Here's the plus 2s. And here's some interesting looking stuff. By the way, the dots here are equispaced just as the dash lengths are equispaced in the Holmes and Nelson Atlas. Therefore, you get a sense of the velocity along the path by the spacing of the dots. Each of these dots is the same crank angle input over here, which for a constant speed input is the same delta time. So notice this is going really fast across this portion because it's going from there to there in the same time that it takes to go from there to there on this part of the curve. So there's a huge quick return ratio in this curve. So if you need some very crazy motions in your machine, to pick something up and place it over here and turn it upside down and whatnot, these linkages have some potential. Quite a large variety of curves. I'll leave it to you to figure out how to get the data out. It's very much like the Holmes and Nelson. Okay, let's move on in the interest of time. And go back to our slideshow, which is just about over. Here's a summary of what we've talked about today. The couple of curves of simple linkages, I'm talking about four bar and geared five bar here, can provide very complex and interesting motions. We can use those for path generation, which is what we've been looking at today. By that is meant I'm moving a point along a path. I'm not, at that instant, when I'm considering path motion, I'm not really concerned about the orientation of the link. That, however, could be a serious issue and I can deal with that by introducing duplicate linkages or cognates of the same linkage. And then I can get what's called parallel motion, in which I control a line in the plane to, f to follow the path of interest, which would be the coupler curve. And every point on that line follows the same path, thus the parallel motion uh, uh, terminology. And I can also use couple of paths to make dwell mechanisms, and that's the subject of another tape. Thank you. We'll see you on the next video.